Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're gonna take a look at an overview of the brain. We're gonna have a look at the development of the brain and also important structures of the brain and their relevant functions. But to begin, you need to understand that the brain with all of its convolutions and complexities actually began as a hollow tube. So at around about three weeks gestation, we have this hollow tube called the neural tube that will ultimately become the brain, brainstem, and spinal cord. Now from three weeks till around about five weeks, you'll find that various aspects of this tube begin to swell and they form vesicles. You can see that there's one, two, three, four, five vesicles that you need to understand because they become really important landmarks of the brain. So let's start at the top, move our way down. So the very first vesicle you need to be aware of is that of the telencephalon. Now, when we have a look at these words, they look a bit funny. Importantly, the suffix, the part at the end, is going to be encephalon all the way through for all of these vesicles. So the first is telencephalon. Encephalon means brain. The first part, the prefix, that's the important part. So telencephalon, telos in Greek, actually means the end, the end point. So, Telencephalon means end of brain, which makes sense because it's the end of the neural, the, the developing neural tube. If we were to have a look at this neural tube continually developing, you'll find that the telencephalon actually begins to, well, continues to swell and folds over like that. And again, ultimately becomes this massive structure right here that makes up most of the brain that we call the cerebrum. So the telencephalon actually produces the cerebrum. So let's take a quick look at the cerebrum. Again, the cerebrum is the largest part of the brain and is comprised of two hemispheres. You can see these two hemispheres here. The two hemispheres are actually separated out by what we call a fissure or a splitting down the middle here. And this is what we call the longitudinal fissure the longitudinal fissure separates out the left and right hemispheres of the brain. Importantly, the left hemisphere controls what's happening on the right hand side of the body and the right hemisphere controls what's happening on the left hand side of the body. Right controls left, left controls right. And another important point is that some functions of the brain actually sit more so on one hemisphere than the other. So for example, for most of us, language, being able to understand and comprehend language, sits predominantly on the left hemisphere. Now, this is termed laterality, where functions predominantly sit on one side compared to another. Laterality. Now structurally, if we were to look at the cerebrum, again, even though it's the biggest part of the brain, you'll find that the outer one to five millimeters of the cerebrum is termed the cortex. So cortex just means outer layer, right? So this is what we call the cerebral cortex. And the cerebral cortex is the seat of consciousness. It is the substrate for consciousness. Let's write this down, right? The cortex equals consciousness. That's really important. For you to become consciously aware of anything, it must get to that outer one to five millimeters. So the fact that you are understanding and comprehending what I'm saying to you right now is because information that I'm delivering to you is reaching your cortex. And you can actually separate the cortex out into various lobes, various functional lobes. So roughly, the separating lines for these lobes are like this. So you've got the frontal lobe sitting at the front, unsurprisingly, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe sitting in around about your temple, your ear. Now in actual fact, if you were to lift up your temporal lobe and have a look, there's gonna be another lobe called the insula. Some recognize it as a lobe, some don't, but it is a functional lobe. Let's write these lobes down here and just talk very briefly about what they do. I have done a video on each lobe if you want more detail. So the frontal lobe has a couple of important functions. First of which is that right here in the frontal lobe, 
is what we call our primary motor cortex. So the frontal lobe contains the motor cortex. This is where we want to consciously initiate movement. The fact that I can consciously write and draw is because information is beginning here at the motor cortex sitting in the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe also has, particularly if we look more anteriorly, more towards the front, this is the seat of higher understanding, higher integration, high degrees of consciousness. What am I saying here? I'm saying that basically it controls really complex behavior. You knowing how to act in a particular situation, how to act socially amongst one person compared to another person, for example. It's our higher order reasoning. That's another thing that sits on the frontal lobe, higher order reasoning. Really important. Parietal lobe, let's take a look. The parietal lobe doesn't have a motor cortex, but right here, opposing the motor cortex, it has a sensory cortex called the somatosensory cortex. So think about it. Signals initiating in the motor cortex of the frontal lobe go down to our motor neurons and to our muscles to say to move. But the somatosensory cortex is receiving signals coming up so you can understand what's happening in your environment, whether it's your internal environment or external environment. So it's gonna pick up signals on touch, pain, temperature, pressure, vibration, proprioception, whole bunch of sensory pieces of information. And if it gets to this somatosensory cortex, you become aware of it. So parietal has the sensory or somatosensory cortex. Really important. Occipital lobe. The occipital lobe simply allows for us to be able to see. So it's important for vision. Temporal lobe is important for us to be able to hear. And lifting that temporal lobe up and having a look at the insula is important for taste, gustation, gustatory. But let's just write taste. So that's a quick overview of the various lobes. Now this is only the outer one to five millimeters of the cortex or I should say the outer one to five millimeters of the cerebrum. There's deeper structures within the cerebrum. This includes parts of the basal ganglia and parts of the limbic system as well, which I think we need to briefly mention. Let's write this down. Parts of the basal ganglia and again, parts, not all, and limbic system, again, parts and not all. Now, what do I mean by parts and not all? I'm saying that other aspects or structures of these systems here actually sit within other vesicles or basically arise from these other vesicles. What does the basal ganglion limbic system do? Well, to put it simply, the basal ganglia is important for initiating and smoothing out motor movement. So initiating, initiating and smoothing out motor movement or motor activity. Motor movement's a bit redundant. Motor activity. An example of this is if I want to walk and walk smoothly, that's the basal ganglia smoothing that out. People who have deficits in the basal ganglia, specifically dopamine, that's the neurotransmitter used here, if that's diminished or gone, people find it hard to initiate a movement and they also have a resting tremor, so they don't have that smooth movement. That's why the basal ganglia is important there. Limbic system, really important in emotion. Other things as well, but let's just highlight emotion. All right, so this is basically the cerebrum. Let's now move on to the next part. That's the telencephalon. This next part highlighted in blue is called the diencephalon. Diencephalon. So again, encephalon, suffix meaning brain, di means between or within. Why is that? Well, you can see, again, as this neural tube continues to develop, it becomes encased or sits within or between the telencephalon as it begins to fold in. And again, that's looking at it from a front-on view. Let's look at it from a side-on view like we've got here. You can see it's sitting inside here. There's the diencephalon.
Now the diencephalon has two really important structures. It has the thalamus, the thalamus, and the hypothalamus. What do these two structures do? So, thalamus and hypothalamus. In actual fact, most of that there is the thalamus, and the hypothalamus is basically going to be sitting like that, and it has a protrusion like that called the pituitary gland, which we'll talk about in a sec. So, thalamus, hypothalamus. What do they do? Firstly, let's look at the thalamus. The thalamus, let's put it over here. The thalamus is the sorting center or relay center. It's the post office of the brain. It takes information and decides where it needs to go. Let me give you an example. Somebody were to tickle my hand or tickle my finger. That signal will move down the nerves in my arm into my spinal cord and continue to move up. It moves up the spinal cord through the brain stem and gets to the thalamus. The thalamus goes, okay, what is this signal? Where did it come from? Where does it need to go? It goes, oh, it came from your hand and it's a sensory signal. I need to send it to the somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe. We spoke about that before, right? In actual fact, all of this area here within that parietal lobe, all of this area here has a map of the whole body on it that can pick up sensation. And there's going to be a part map to the hand. The thalamus knows this and will throw this tickling sensation that it received up to the relevant area of that somatosensory cortex. It will do that with all types of sensation that you need to become consciously aware of. So for example, pain. Somebody pricks my finger to the thalamus, throws it to the part of the parietal lobe that deals with experiencing pain of that part of the body. Brilliant. So that's why it's called the sorting center or relay center. What about the hypothalamus? Well, hypo means below. Thalamus, sitting below the thalamus. And you can see that in what I've drawn up here. The hypothalamus sitting below the thalamus. The hypothalamus is actually what we call the master regulator, master regulator of two important things. Master regulator of the endocrine system and the master regulator of the autonomic nervous system. So the endocrine system is hormones. Hormones that can control growth and development and functioning of the body, the hypothalamus can control this by producing and releasing its own hormones. It can also stimulate this pituitary gland that sits underneath it to release its hormones as well. And there's a whole range of hormones that can be released. Hormones like oxytocin involved in milk letdown and bonding, uh, antidiuretic hormone for holding on to fluid in times of dehydration or low blood pressure. It can also involve releasing hormones associated with the thyroid, with the adrenal gland, with our uh, sex glands as well, so our uh, testes and our ovaries, a whole wide range of hormones. Autonomic nervous system is the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Sympathetic, fight or flight, and parasympathetic, rest and digest. Again, all controlled by the hypothalamus. All right, so that's the thalamus and hypothalamus in the diencephalon. Let's look at the next part. The next part is the mesencephalon. Again, encephalon means brain, mes means middle, it's the middle of the brain, and you can see it is there, right? Middle of the brain, middle of the brain. The mesencephalon actually comprises of the midbrain. The midbrain is the most superior or upper aspect of the brain stem. I'm not going to talk about its function at the moment because I want to talk about all aspects of the brain stem together as one. I've done a very specific video on the individual aspects of the brainstem, feel free to watch that. So we've got the midbrain, part of the mesencephalon sitting here as well. Next part is the metencephalon and the metencephalon, metencephalon, met actually means behind, so behind the brain. Why is that? Well let's take a look. That's part of the metencephalon and that's part of the metencephalon. Let's look at it from a lateral view. It's here and here. You can see that's the pons and that's the cerebellum, which is sitting behind the brain. So the metencephalon contains the pons, which is the next part of the brainstem. Pons. But also the 
cerebellum. So let's take a look now at the cerebellum over here. What does the cerebellum do? Well, the cerebellum does three really important things. And again, I've done a video on the cerebellum looking at the specifics, but here's an overview. It's important for tone, balance, and coordination. Tone, balance, and coordination. Of what? Well, obviously, motor activity. The tone, how contracted it needs to be. The balance, where should you be in your space? And coordination, what pattern of firing needs to occur. The cerebellum fine tunes information that's coming from the motor cortex. So if I want to initiate the ability to move, I need to check with the cerebellum that it's doing the right thing. An example I like to give to my students is, I'm helping a friend move house. They say, Mike, there's a heavy box there, be careful when you lift it. I go, sure, I'm strong, I can do this. I walk up to it, I bend with my knees, not with my back, grab the box, lift it, and when I immediately I realize that the box is empty. It's not heavy at all. So signals are now going from my motor cortex to the cerebellum and they're firing through. The cerebellum says, whoa, you need to change the tone, balance and coordination of these muscles in this movement. So that's what the cerebellum does. And again, that's going to be part of the MET encephalon. So midbrain pons, brainstem, last part is going to be the last part of the brainstem, which is this lowest aspect here, the deepest part here called the myel encephalon. Myle, what's that referring to? Myle means marrow, it means the pith, the deepest part. In actual fact, it contains the medulla, and the medulla also means the deepest part, right? Specifically, you could call it the medulla oblongata, but often just referred to as the medulla, the deepest part. You can see here, 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 it's the deepest aspect of the brain. That's the medulla. So now we've got the three parts of the brainstem. We've got the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. What do they do? What does the brainstem do? It does a whole bunch. It's really important in basic functioning of the body. Let's write it over here. Brainstem. The brainstem has a couple of extremely important functions, one of which is it's really important when it comes to heart rate, breathing, again breathing rate and breathing pattern, blood pressure, blood pressure, certain reflexes of the head and neck that can include the cough reflex for example and the corneal reflex but also houses the nuclei of the cranial nerves. Nuclei of the cranial nerves. Nuclei is just where they live, right? The home of the cranial nerves. There's 12 pairs. These are nerves that shoot in and out of the brain and brain stem, and they control what's happening at the head and neck and a little bit below. So when it comes to sensation of the head and neck, cranial nerves. When it comes to motor movement of the head and neck, cranial nerves. And many of the nuclei of these cranial nerves live in the brain stem itself. And the brain stem is also the conduit for information going from the brain down and going from the body up to the brain. All right. So what we've gone through, telencephalon, diencephalon, mesencephalon, metencephalon, myelencephalon. Now, sometimes you'll see these two put together right, as the prosencephalon. And you'll see the met and myelencephalon put together as the rhombencephalon. All right? But this is the five important vesicles you need to know, the important substructures or landmarks of the brain that they produce, and their various functions as an overview. I hope that helps. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video and want to watch more, please hit the like and subscribe button.